I've been working in, in technology for the last 25 years for the same organization, for AbilityNet. And we're a, a technology and disability charity. So I'm all about playing with technology to make sure that people, regardless of you know need or impairment, are able to get the most out of work, education, uh, leisure, you know, everything's digital these days. And technology can not only help you access that digital life that, uh, you know, is, is kind of front and centre these days, but also with the right adjustments, the right adaptations, in some cases some specialist tech, then you can um, overcome whatever barriers you have, like myself, I'm blind, um, to be able to be an active, you know, play an active part in that uh, that life but um, as we'll talk about no doubt a little bit later on there are some hurdles if things aren't inclusive in the digital space but um, yeah really lucky to have been playing with tech uh, that's just got better and better and is helping more and more people live really inclusive independent lives for well over two decades. How do you personally go about explaining the importance of online accessibility to someone who'd never even considered it? That's a really good question. I mean, it's so important. All you really need to say to people is, you know, just think about how much you rely on your phone, on the internet, on email, whatever it might be in the digital space. And imagine that that's taken away or it becomes infinitely harder for you to do. It's, you know, frustrating anyway when websites aren't designed um, to be easy to use for example they're not intuitive or if you're using a device where the touch screens you know playing up you know like it's one of the um, older devices when touchscreen technology wasn't really quite there um, everyone's sort of familiar with the idea of having to um, deal with a touchscreen which every second tap isn't registering um, on some cheap appliance for example with an early touchscreen but even more than that, even more tangible, you can ask them to do some really simple things. On most desktop browsers, you can just do control minus a few times and that text will be so small, you'll be struggling to see it. So, you know, just ask them to bang control minus a few times or command minus and, um, hmm, okay, that's, that is a problem. You know, that's really difficult. And that's what it's like for some people with a vision impairment, for example. Take their phone out into the sun ask them to whack the brightness down on their screen until you know they would struggle to see it or just pick a website that hasn't got good color contrast and ask them to have a go and just you know keep it like that for half an hour half an hour that's all we're asking they will be tearing their hair out um, imagine you can never put those settings back you've got to live with that for the rest of your life that's what you know dealing with inaccessible websites with poor color contrast for example or ones that don't let you increase the text size can um, feel like and how it will you know significantly impact those people uh, every single day of their lives you know websites are so far from being um, you know universally inclusive that these are the challenges that people face on your browser just start hitting the tab key on any web page and see how many times you lose the focus because maybe it's jumped somewhere unintuitive in a kind of a weird tabbing order or maybe because the highlight isn't there at all or it could be that it's, you know, um, focusing on hidden elements that the designer never intended it to gain focus, but didn't actually check with the tabbing order. So there are so many times when um, it's really easy to show people what it feels, what inaccessibility feels like. Uh, for me as a screen reader user, you know, I rely on speech output. Um, you can just triple click the home button on a on a smartphone or the side button um, there are gestures on other devices to bring up the speech and just ask them to drag their finger down an Amazon um, app web page of, of um, products or the website itself all of the product images are massive long strings that will then be spoken out and really uh, mess with your um, ability to access that content thankfully the other important elements of Amazon's website or app, for example, are uh, interactable with, you know, they're inclusive. So, you know, you actually can use those, but still you have so much garbage to listen to. And that's the same on so many websites, uh, web pages as well. So, you know, there are simple things you can do. How do you think the internet will change over the next 10 years? And what specific features or habits that exist now do you hope will be seen as from their time? I just want to step back to um, kind of give a very brief history of the kind of progression mm -hmm. of UI. So, you know, the desktop browser came along first and the 
web developers were throwing the kitchen sink at it. You know, as soon as something else came along, you know, JavaScript, Ajax, um, pop-ups, Flash, all these different things, people really went to town. And that was really challenging for a lot of people because there was inconsistencies in how things were done. You know, there was no standardization in UX. UX wasn't even really a thing. Um, and a lot of things were very, very challenging. And if you think about what I was just talking about a moment ago, where people with different impairments, different access methodologies have extra kind of more extreme requirements, then they become, you know, extremely unusable or, you know, very, very challenging for those people as well. Then mobile came along, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we started to have smartphones with touch screens and everything was distilled down into, you know, a fifth of the size, an eighth of the size. And that meant that web developers, um, web copy editors had to impose a lot more discipline on themselves. They couldn't, um, you know, put in nearly as much as they needed to do. They had to cut the, cop the copy right down to about a third of you would have on a desktop. Um, they had to really think about the UI, really limit the number of controls, and that really helped with usability and it really helped with accessibility and inclusion as well. Luckily, too, um, the, the big players like Apple and um, Google with Android kind of followed close behind. They made sure that the building, building blocks for um, WebKit in the case of iOS or um, UIKit in the case of uh, doing a, a, an app on iOS and ditto with Android, you know, the building blocks were really uh, very inclusive. You had, you had to actually break accessibility by not following the steps that they'd outlined uh, or going custom with certain controls. And, you know, certainly that did happen in a lot of cases. I'm not saying that every iOS app or website is accessible, you know, that's been optimized for iOS, but just the, the discipline of having to go to a much smaller screen size was brilliant. And that really helped a lot of people across a wide range of disabilities and just everybody else as well. In the future, in the next five or 10 years, screens are gonna get smaller. I mean, I've already got, you know, a tiny screen on my wrist. Um, you know, screens may go away altogether. And a lot of people are talking about the third age of computing. You know, you had desktop, then mobile, and now we've got like ambient computing where you just talk to the air and you get, you know, really useful results. There may be a screen involved, there might not. Um, you know, it ties in with all of these things about computers being scattered all over your body, all over your house, all over the environment. And there will be something intelligent on tap for you to be able to interact with. So I think the future of the Internet is going to be one of hopefully simplification, further simplification, because people have come to expect much more discipline, much more thoughtful design when it comes to UI and UX, um, but also whoever's developing the you know apps and and websites of the future probably won't be able to assume anything about the platforms that they're going to be consumed on you know if wikipedia hadn't been there or thereabouts with regards to the accessibility of their content then they wouldn't have been the go-to um, for the echoes or other smart speakers to be able to just scrape that content and have it spoken back to uh, us in a very intelligent way. So, you know, you just don't know what platforms your content's going to be delivered through. And we're going to see a massive proliferation of platforms as we've seen over recent years, you know, transparent screens, every shop window or bus stop that you pass, you know, those sheets of glass are now going to be delivering content to you. You're probably going to have similar screens on your face. Um, Apple glasses, probably the Gen 1 this year. Um, and Gen 2 for the consumer model coming up in 2023. Just, you know, the rumor mill, but still, you know, there's going to be a massive increase in the platforms that you're going to be delivered on. How can you make sure that your content is going to be fit for purpose across platform? Well, just follow the accessibility guidelines. They're all about separating content from presentation um, because people need to be able to apply their own presentation, whether it's text size, um, having it spoken out, etc. There's going to be so many reasons why the accessibility guidelines would just make products that are fit for purpose uh, over the next five, ten years. If you're with someone who needs to check how accessible their website is, but you only have five, but they only have five minutes, talk us through how you go about showing them. 
Cool. Yeah, that's a really good question. I've kind of covered it earlier um, in sort of things that they can readily do to see if it isn't accessible. But to make sure it is accessible, then um, there's a brilliant acronym, SCULPT, from Helen Wilson at Worcestershire County Council, um, which we often uh, use in our blog posts and, and webinars and things. If you just search for SCULPT, and accessibility, you'll see this infographic online. It's really, really good um, as an aid memoir and particularly for people that are new to accessibility. So what does it stand for? S is for structure, good use of headings, semantic, you know, use of headings and to structure the page properly. Um, so yeah, it'll be teaching people about headings. C is for colors. Make sure that they are sufficiently contrasting for people that have a vision impairment and they don't use danger color combinations like red, green, blue, yellow um, next to each other or in a you know key to a, a graph or a chart or something for people with color deficit conditions. U is actually for use of images, uh, just go with it. Um, and that's about alternative text, uh, making sure it's appropriate and present and also using images to kind of back up text, the meaning of text, etc., to split up you know, large chunks of text and also to add um, important information for people that you know find a lot of language a lot of just straight text difficult they reckon that the average literacy age of people in the UK is nine reading age of nine which is quite shocking really but that would certainly help by backing it up with images L is for links making sure that links make sense out of context please don't just make the link the part of a link in a sentence just like here click here for blah 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 because for a screen reader user like myself, I pull all those links up into a list to find the contact us one or the, you know, something that I'm expecting or hoping to find on a page. And if it just says more, for example, then that's not going to make sense to me. So good use of links as well. P is for plain language, plain English. If you search for plain English, uh, it's a thing, capital P, capital L. It's about making um, you know, choices about simple use of words, go for a good old Anglo-Saxon word rather than a Latin or Greek origin word. And then that's really going to help those people um, who find, you know, reading a challenge and it'll help everybody else with a learning difficulty too. And the last one is T for tables. Please don't make use tables to, you know, lay out your, your web pages or your email, you know, marketing campaigns or whatever it might be. Tables should just be for data. And when you use them for data, try and make them as simple as possible and not merging rows and columns and things like that. So, yeah, sculpt sounds complicated, but when you're giving people uh, kind of an aid memoir so that when they are building content, they can make sure that they you know, bear those things in mind, then it is a bit tortured, but hopefully it'll help them remember. In terms of the adoption of accessible digital products, what do you think is the biggest challenge? I mean, you'd think it'd be a no brainer making uh, products accessible because you're reaching a massive audience, you know, the purple pound, 274 oh. billion pounds an annum, you know, a year in the UK. That's the estimated disposable income for of people with disabilities and their families. So, you know, you don't want to be turning these people off. And making them frustrated you know for me i could easily be the one in our family who's booking those airline tickets or who's buying that product online and if i get frustrated i might go somewhere else and you've lost you know that income from a whole family um where we've got you know we've got stuff to buy on your you know we've got money to spend on your on your services etc um so yeah but i think a lot of it is kind of lack of awareness and the fact that it feels like it's a little bit scary and there's a lot of work to it and if you're not up to speed then it definitely would feel like that absolutely the first thing to say is that you know whilst the guidelines themselves are quite technical not everyone who touches web or you know digital needs to be an expert on them there are subsets there are cheat sheets there are checklists things that people can do depending on your role um, for the organization as a whole it's really important that you think about embedding accessibility across everything that you do. So AbilityNet have got this process called DAM, Digital Accessibility Maturity Model, where we would walk you through. There's also a download self-serve version, um, looking at all the areas of your organization across digital, uh, from training to resourcing, to leadership, to you know um, support across the different teams, et cetera, uh, procurement, all of these different things and help you gauge where you are today and how you can level up to an area you know to a point of best practice to be in that kind of end zone um, 
and that would really help because the more you embed maturity the less firefighting the less um actual resourcing because you know it will cost a lot to retrofit accessibility if it hasn't been thought about from the start and in many cases it's not even viable and that's a crime i think um particularly as it's been a legal requirement for well over well arguably uh 20 odd years now but certainly since the equality act 2010 there is absolutely no excuse because you have to proactively build in accessibility it's not an excuse to say well we've never had any complaints we don't think we've got any disabled employees for example or customers that's not an excuse anymore so yeah really really important um make sure it's not a bolt-on particularly in light of the fact that you know it's now for everyone uh, digital inclusion will just make your products better for every single user what is one thing that every single person can do or learn to play a part in the progression towards an accessible internet not everybody has an explicit sort of digital role so this question may have been aimed at you know web developers designers uh, copywriters you know but i'm actually going to broaden it out i'm going to say every single person and that is to use the accessibility checker in word mm -hmm. in uh, excel in outlook uh, we wouldn't dream in a professional context of you know saving off a, a word document um, without running the spell checker or you know sending an email although i hesitate there because a lot of people do have typos in their emails so maybe that's not quite but you know send um, signing off on a professional document in a corporate you know setting without making sure that there aren't really ugly typos in there i'm hoping that there will be the same approach to the accessibility checker it's well surfaced in office right across the different office apps those are the go-to places where a lot of digital content is created even you know stuff that ends up on the web certainly digital marketing campaigns which a lot of people think don't really count because they're only you know going to be existing for several weeks you know it's kind of not as big a deal Everyone can just run a spell check, so why not be able to run that accessibility checker as well? It's really easy to follow. It will give you brilliant tips. It will almost walk you through it. And in doing that, you're gonna end up with a more accessible document, but also you're gonna be learning on the way as well.